You sold down. Yes. Yes, I do. I remember. Um, I did. I did that twice. Two different translations. I do remember the especially because I remember I can read music just enough that I'd be sitting in the middle of the orchestra for all practical purposes, reading the score to remember where I came in. Not, not here, not with those notes. But this whole bunch of notes here. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me, I do. <laughs> I can say this to Santa Cruz people especially because you must remember so much of this book was written in Bali Doom in a back bedroom of that shack sweating and cursing and mumbling to myself I quit that book once and would have quit it again if my wife and children hadn't urged me to push on. And the only part, well, two things. I remember the, the song lyrics, the incidental songs in the last year. But that was fun. I love writing songs. And it's the one thing I really got from Tolkien, whom I wasn't imitating at all. I did like the way he scattered songs and poems through the Lord of the Rings. I thought I'd like to do that. For the rest, what I do remember, even then, is writing the scene when Molly meets the unicorn for the first time. It's, the, it's part of the book I'm proudest of. I don't know how I did it. I, know, I was in my late 20s. And I still had, I can't have known what life had been like for Molly. I really think she pulled that scene off more than I did. But that's the part I still look, I still look back to. I'm skimming through the last year of the war, which I don't do a lot. Of. Now you're in trouble. The audience have mics too. <laughs> what gave you the idea of making the movie? Um, it was originally before the movie. It was a book which you'll read one day. And <laughs> the what gave me the idea was simply that I was sharing a house one summer, the summer of 1962, with a childhood friend who was a painter. And the only reason I started that story was that he was out every day working on a huge landscape. He'd come back every day with this big painting and more paint on the canvas every day. I just started The Last Unicorn almost out of nowhere to show him that I was working too. <laughs> I wrote the line, the unicorn lived in a lilac wood, and she lived all alone. Now what? <laughs> we, talked about, we talked about this a few years ago, and he told me, I hated that landscape. I would, I would have cut the dead thing up and made four paintings out of it, and just dropped it all together, but you were back at the cabin writing this book. <laughs> and that summer I wrote 85 pages. Um, quit came to Santa Cruz, learned how to take care of people and feed, put bread on the table, and every now and then write something in the last year in the room, and mostly I'd, I'd had it. I'd had it if my wife hadn't in it, hadn't been, hadn't prodded me into starting it again. I don't think I would have. Next question. Mr. Beagle. Um, I have, I believe, one of the original copies, the paperback copies of The Last Unicorn. And on the inside cover, it mentions the address of Roach Road. What was your position in life at that time? Were you in the process of writing the book? There in freedom? Uh, wait a minute, I'm not sure. Roach Road? Mm -hmm. I may refer to it. No, I don't think I even used the phrase. It's in the book. That's what I was wondering about. Oh, that's funny. I have to look at it. <laughs> I lived on East Rianto Road. No, that's, that's Watsonville. I lived on Smith Grade and about a quarter of a mile walk from Smith Grade to the shack. But when the first paperback came out, yeah, I was still living in that address, but I moved very shortly afterward. I have to see that to get clear on it. I'm not sure. Give it a microphone. Hold on. 
<laughs> the light's red, but it works anyway. Um, what was your inspiration for writing the last unicorn? Just competitiveness. So I was just saying, just because my roommate, my housemate, my childhood buddy, Bill Segunder, who's a wonderful painter today, was working on a painting. This was going to be our working summer. And he was going to be painting, and I was going to be figuring what I'd do after publishing one novel and having the second one turned down by the publisher. It was very much at loose ends. And I just started writing The Last Unicorn for no other inspiration but that Phil kept coming back every day with more paint on the canvas. And I had to show him that I wasn't fully around. I was a professional like him. By the way, everybody, that version doesn't bear a lot of resemblance to the version you know. It's set in modern day. There was no Mami Fortuna or Schmendrick or Taggart or there any of that stuff. It was all, the butterfly was there, but that was about it. And the unicorn in this one. That one, that version, learns about the disappearance of her people from a dragon who has had a very rough encounter with the 20th century. He's <laughs> crawling back into the forest to possibly to die, but certainly to recuperate. He mentions that he, he tail got run over by a semi, <laughs> and he got a ticket for being an unlicensed, oversized vehicle. <laughs> and he adds to the unicorn. Oh, sure, I ate the policeman, but it didn't make me feel any better. <laughs> There's some good bits in it. Okay, and now we have a question from the Lady of Montpelier. Yes, indeed. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the success, the huge success of this story? Did you anticipate the huge uh, resonation that this work would have with the world? No, not for a minute. I just wanted the bloody thing done with it. <laughs> out of my hair. The only person who called it was the novelist, the poet, Robert Nathan, who was as much an inspiration to me as more, I'm saying it's, as any other writer, certainly more. He was a good bit older than I, and we became friends for the last 20 years of his life. And I sent him, I dedicated the last unicorn to him, and sent him the manuscript. And he read the manuscript, read right past the dedication, never noticed it, but he called me to say, this is going to be the book people know, don't know that you ever wrote anything else. You're gonna be stuck with this the way I'm stuck with Portrait of Jenny, which was one of the, his 40 novels that was made into a movie and overshadowed everything else he ever did. He said, He said, you'll write books you possibly like better. And they may go out of print, people may not like them, they may get bad reviews, and nobody will notice them. And he said, you'll, you'll love it and hate it at different times in your life. So, but the last analysis, finally, he said, it does beat the hell out of not being remembered at all. <laughs> okay, because we've got time, time for the movie, I'm going to have a question here, a question in the middle, you, and then somebody in the middle in the back. And Peter, he's a singer. Uh, hi, I'm over here. <laughs> right, the, 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 okay, so the light right in my eyes. Oh. Um, I was just wondering if you based oh. the character Schmendrick and, and Mommy Fortuna on people you'd actually met in Santa Cruz. <laughs> um, no, not people. Landscape, yes. A lot of the landscape in The Last Unicorn does come from Santa Cruz County in general. When I knew, finally, and I didn't know for a long time where the hell the unicorns were, and that they'd be coming out of the sea, I remember going down to the coast, I can't remember which beach, and sitting there, and sitting there, and I think I made three separate trips trying to imagine the unicorns appearing out of our legendary surf. And finally, that was the last part of the book I wrote. I went all the way to the end, and then went back and wrote that scene where the unicorns come out of the sea. It took me a couple of days. But people know. No, I don't think so. There are always bits and pieces of fragments of people you know, but I never put anybody into the book whole. And especially, not, not this one. This was, even for me, one of a kind. Okay, now a little note. One of my jobs is tossing notes. A few years ago, he wrote a song called Deep Woods, The Unicorn Sings to Memory, which is the unicorn remembering lyrics centuries later. 
And in the liner notes for that song, which are printed online, he actually spun this elaborate story about how one day in Santa Cruz at a coffee shop, he rented a couple of musicians named Jingly and Cully, and, and how he took them home, and they camped out overnight, and they told them all these amazing stories, and now they're suing him because, of course, he stole everything from them. <laughs> You'll meet them, you meet them in the movie if you don't know them. <laughs> Here's over there. Over there. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to say it's so wonderful to be here. There was a month in my childhood, or a few months, where I watched this movie every single day. Yeah. Yeah. The songs used to make me and my sister cry. Big deal. Um, so I was um, wondering, um, as a screenwriter, uh, how much of a role, and what, what kind of role did you play in the making of the movie, and what are your feelings about the representation of the book on film? The film is so wonderful. I wrote the script. <coughs> By and large, they filmed it the way I wrote it, which is all any writer can ever get to say for the most part, unless you direct the film yourself. I didn't expect anything because I didn't like Rankin and Bass's work at all. I didn't like what they'd done with Tolkien. I hated Frosty the Bloody Snowman. Let <laughs> alone Rudolph the Flipping Reindeer. Rudolph the Flipping Reindeer. And so, um, I was overwhelmed by what they'd actually done. It was the best thing they ever did. And they went out and got a real songwriter instead of the, instead of the, the one of the producers being, doing the lyrics and the music editor doing their songs. They actually went out and got Jimmy Webb. And they got real actors, most of whom knew the book and loved it. it made that kind of difference. So I have absolutely no complaints. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Um, how much, I wanted to know how much uniform lore you had done research-wise, and now seeing that you know, our last unicorn is female for years, unicorns have been depicted as male, uh, and now you forever have changed how unicorns are seen and uh, thought of as, as female now. And did you go into that with any intention? Or had you done any research on the I have done what research you could do in 1962 in the Pittsfield, Massachusetts Library, because that's where, that's near where my friend Phil and I were summering. But it didn't occur to me, one way or the other, that I was creating the first female unicorn in literature. She was female from that first line. The unicorn lived in the lilac wood, and she lived all alone. That was that. I never thought of it one way or the other until I started getting hysterical phone calls from <laughs> translators. I can remember one especially from Romania who kept insisting that there was no equivalent in his or her various languages. There was no way of creating a female unicorn. And there wasn't even a neutral tense, as neutral case as there is in German. To sidestep the issue, because in, in Germany, at least the edition is Das Letzte Einhorn. But, no, I didn't need to make trouble for anybody. <laughs> He's leaving something out. There's a story that's too good to let sit on the floor here. Your mother, elementary school. Oh, Lord. Yes. <laughs> when I was, I was about four years old, my mother, who was an elementary school teacher, took me to meet her class. And, and I don't remember any of this. She told me about it. That I sat in front of the, her class for that whole period and told them about unicorns. <laughs> and when the class period was over, I don't think I bowed. I'm pretty sure I didn't. But I did say, thank you. I'll come back sometime and tell you more about unicorns. <laughs> and he did. <laughs>